Video 3 for Sustainability. Section 7.3, How Human Activities Can Affect Sustainability. Matter and energy are recycled through all four of Earth's systems, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the biosphere. Essential matter, such as carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, oxygen, water, and other nutrients are used and reused in repeating cycles. What could interrupt natural cycling of matter? Humans. Um, humans' activities such as the production of material that cannot be broken down into essential matter easily. So if we think about all the waste we put in the dump, if it can't be broken down easily, then those um, essential matter can't go back into the cycle. Nutrient cycle and sustainability of aquatic ecosystems. Human activity, such as fertilizing crops, interrupts the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. So that's how nitrogen and phosphorus move through um, our four, our four uh, spheres. Excess nitrogen and excess phosphorus run off into aquatic systems. So first we have fertilizers run off. Then we'll have an algae bloom, and that's where you have extra algae growing. And this will grow along the top layer. And all the submerged plants will die due to the lack of light, so they're not getting the light they need because of this algae. And then the algae and other plants die because there's nothing for the algae or the plants to eat. So the fish basically run out of food and oxygen. Um, eutrophic this is known as eutrophication. It's a process in which nutrient levels in aquatic system increase, leading to the increased population of the primary producers. Okay, it blocks the light. Um, and then they run out of food and water. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are atmospheric gases that prevent heat from leaving the atmosphere, thus increasing the temperature of the atmosphere. Many scientists hypothesize that an increased concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere along with an increase in other greenhouse gases, such as methane, um, contribute to global climate change. When did carbon dioxide start to rise? Well, if we look at um, map B, this is our global temperature change, and we really, we start to see a drastic rise um, in between World War One and World War Two, and then it really kicks off in the 70s. Um, if we look at carbon dioxide, um, it was very level off, and then our Industrial Revolution occurred. And when the Industrial Revolution, we dramatically increased our fossil fuel sources. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. There are many ways to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere, including international initiatives by governments from around the world, initiatives by federal, provincial, and local governments, and efforts by individuals. Name three examples of efforts to reduce carbon dioxide. 
So like this sign that we see outside our school, no idling. So therefore, we're releasing less CO2 into the atmosphere. You may have heard of the Kyoto Protocol. And that is an international agreement of over 180 countries to reduce emissions and was an international effort to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Um, there's a national effort um, about keeping our national forests. So we're trying to preserve um, the boreal forest. And that's because it's a natural carbon sink. Um, and it's an example of a national effort. We also uh, have recycling programs. And the idea here is we reduce our carbon emissions because less energy is required to recycle products than to create them from raw materials. It's an example of an effort by individuals, corporations, and municipalities. Recycling also reduces the amount of material going into landfills, waste dumps, which has other environmental benefits. Trophic levels. Matter and energy are transferred between trophic levels within a biosphere. Trophic efficiency is a measure of how much energy in an organism at one trophic level transfers to the next. Describe in your own words how energy moves from one trophic level to the next. Well, we start with our primary uh, producers. And these organisms, such as plants, can make their own food. So say they have 100 units. Of that 100 units, only 10% of that energy goes to our jackrabbit, which is our primary consumer, our herbivore. Of that 100 units, 10% of what they got from the grass, um, our long-tail weasel only gets 10% of that, which is 10 energy units. And our top consumer, if it has the weasel, it only gets 10% of that 10 energy. So it gets one energy unit. So that's why we're limited to four in a food chain and trophic levels. We're limited to four because we run out of energy. Because there's no more energy to be passed on. Um, trophic levels also affect bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation is the process in which materials, um, especially toxins, are ingested by an organism at a greater rate than they are eliminated from the organism's body. Biomagnification is the increased concentration of a toxin as it moves from one trophic level to the next. DDT and PVCs are pollutants that have affected organisms. How might uh, PCBs affect herring galls? Well, PCBs increase at each trophic level, and the greatest health problems are found at the highest trophic level, which would be our herring galls. So, if we look here, we don't have much PVC in the water. It's very small. But our primary producer, the phytoplankton, they have more because of them they live and take in the water as part of their growth and development. The zooplankton are our primary consumers, and they feed off of the phytoplankton. So they can't just have one phytoplankton. They have many phytoplankton. And because they have many phytoplankton, they have a lot more PCBs in them. The same goes with the rainbow smelt. 
It also has a lot more PVCs, P PCBs, because it has to eat a lot more phytoplankton to get enough energy to survive. But in so doing so, he also has more PCBs in it because each one of those zooplankton, it magnifies, it gets bigger. Our light trout then eats a rainbow smelt, and it too has to eat more than just one rainbow, uh, rainbow smelt, so it builds up. And then our herring gull has to eat the lake trout, and it doesn't eat just one. It eats a lot more. So then when we see our herring gull, the eggs that this herring gull produces also already have uh, PCBs in them. So when these herrings are born and they start to eat this cycle, they'll have even more. Um, but the problem is that these herring gull eggs may never hatch because it usually affects the repro re reproductive abilities of an organism, leading to the decrease in population. In the case of per green falcons, the population were at brink uh, we're on a brink of extinction. And tomorrow we'll look at uh, DDT and how that affects um, a species in Canada and the United States. Um, trophic levels. Terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems are connected. Beluga whales in the St. Lawrence River have a high rate of cancer which scientists suspect is caused by exposure of pollutants from land and water. Why and how might blue whales be exposed to toxic pollutants? Well, scientists hypothesize that pollutants settle in sediments of rivers, which is where the whales feed on invertebrates such as krill and worms. Chemo bi chemicals bioaccumulate in the whale's tissues, which leads to a weakened immune system. So let's review. Human activities that increase the influx of nutrients in a terrestrial or aquatic ecosystem can upset the nutrient balance in an ecosystem. Burning fossil fuels has dramatically increased the concentration of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, in the atmosphere. Most of the stored energy in one trophic level does not move in the next trophic does not move to the next trophic level, only 10%. Bioaccumula bioaccumulation and biomagnification can result in unhealthy levels of pollutants and organisms.